Every year, humanity creates over 10 million tons of this soft stone. It's as light as air, but as strong as steel. Its birth is a spectacular dance of flame and steel, where stone is transformed into billions of fibers. However, behind the impressive footage lies a technological trick that makes this material unique. Wait until the end, and you'll find out how this inconspicuous insulator can change the future of our civilization. At the core of this magical transformation lies a raw material gifted by nature itself or by industry. To create the most well-known type, stone or basalt wool, exclusively rock types are used. Basalt, gabbro, dolomite, and limestone, which make up to 98% of the finished product's weight. In another case, for the production of glass wool, the main components are quartz sand, soda ash, limestone, and, importantly from an environmental perspective, up to 80% recycled glass cullet. There is also slag wool, which is made from blast furnace slag, a byproduct of metallurgical production. It all begins at the raw material yard, with a stage of careful preparation. Rocks are crushed and sorted to obtain fractions of the required size and the ideal mineral composition. The components for the future glass or stone are dosed with pharmaceutical precision because the key properties of the future fibers, their strength, durability, and temperature resistance depend on the correct proportions. Next, the prepared mixture, which professionals call the batch, is sent to its fiery heart, the melting furnace. This could be a vertical cupola furnace, where the raw material is melted by the heat from burning coke, or a huge tank furnace. Here, at a temperature between 1,400 and 1,500 degrees Celsius, the solid components are transformed into a homogeneous, viscous melt. This process is under constant control, as the slightest temperature deviation can change the viscosity of the mass and thus affect the thickness and length of the future fibers. When the stone has finally submitted to the fire and turned into a liquid mass, the most responsible and spectacular stage begins. Fiber formation. The melt is fed in a thin stream onto the rollers of a centrifuge, which rotate at an insane speed. Under the influence of colossal centrifugal force, the red hot mass is stretched and torn into millions of microscopic threads. To make them even thinner, a powerful stream of heated gas or steam is additionally directed at them. This whole process is very reminiscent of making cotton candy, only instead of sugar here, it's molten rock. Right in the process of forming these fibers, a special binding agent is sprayed on them, usually based on safe resins. It is needed to bind billions of individual threads into a single hole. Along with it, hydrophobic additives are added, which give the future insulation water-repellent properties. A cloud of these newly created fibers already treated with a binder, gently settles on a wide, moving conveyor. A special pendulum mechanism evenly distributes them across the entire width, forming a primary, still fluffy and soft mat. It is here that the future structure of the material is laid, chaotic or layered, on which its mechanical characteristics will depend. For this fluffy mat to acquire strength, resilience, and its final form, it is sent into a long polymerization chamber. Here, under the influence of hot air with a temperature of about 250 degrees Celsius, the binding resin hardens, securely bonding the fibers together into a three-dimensional structure. Excess moisture evaporates, and a strong and stable mineral wool web emerges from the chamber. After such a hot hardening, the material needs cooling. Fans blow room temperature air through it, preparing it for the final stage. 
The endless ribbon of mineral wool enters the cutting line. Sharp circular saws and milling cutters cut it lengthwise and crosswise into slabs or rolls of clearly defined sizes. The most modern productions use robotic systems with water jet cutting for this, which ensures perfect accuracy and a complete absence of dust. The final stage before the insulation is sent to construction sites is packaging. Since 99% of the volume of mineral wool is air, it is compressed for ease of transport and storage. Powerful machines compress the product, reducing its volume several times and hermetically pack it in durable film. But don't worry, thanks to the extraordinary resilience of the fibers, after unpacking, the material fully restores its original thickness and all its unique properties in a matter of minutes, ready to serve for decades, keeping our homes warm and cozy. It's important that modern factories have turned production into a virtually waste-free process. All trimmings and material residues are collected and returned to the very beginning of the cycle, into the melting furnace, saving natural resources and energy. The scale of this industry and its real impact are impressive. The mineral wool market in Europe is a giant industry with annual production exceeding 10 million tons. According to expert calculations, over 50 years of operation, every ton of mineral wool produced helps prevent the emission of over 200 tons of carbon dioxide by saving energy on heating and air conditioning. This colossal contribution to the fight against climate change makes the material not just a building material, but also strategically important for the future. Although mineral wool seems soft in its overall mass, each individual fiber is a microscopic needle of glass or stone. Its diameter is only from 3 to 7 micrometers, which is about 10 times thinner than a human hair. Upon contact with the material, especially when it is cut, some of these tiny but brittle fibers break. The sharp fragments get on the skin and mechanically irritate its upper layers, causing a tingling or itching sensation. This sensation is not a chemical or allergic reaction, but purely a mechanical irritation, similar to touching thousands of microscopic splinters. Because of this, when working with mineral wool, it is necessary to use personal protective equipment. Gloves, long-sleeved clothing, goggles, and a respirator. Modern manufacturers have significantly improved the quality of the fiber, making it more elastic and less brittle. Higher quality binders better hold the fibers within the slab, which reduces the amount of dust and free particles. Therefore, today's mineral wool is safer and more comfortable to work with than its counterparts from 20 years ago. Every year, over 150 million cubic meters of plywood are produced worldwide, a volume that could circle the earth several times in train cars. But few people stop to think that behind this lies a unique technology where wood is literally unrolled into a continuous ribbon and then assembled into a super strong material that can withstand colossal loads. How do ordinary logs, after spa treatments in giant pools and a dance with knives, turn into perfectly smooth sheets ready to serve in furniture, ships and even skyscrapers? Watch until the end and you'll discover one hidden secret of this production that isn't talked about publicly. It all starts in the forest, where the best specimens are selected for plywood production. You need perfectly straight, cylindrical trunks without a large number of knots or defects, preferably from birch, alder, pine, or other species. After being delivered to the factory, the logs go through the first and very important stage of preparation hydrothermal treatment. They are submerged in giant pools of hot water, where they spend several hours and sometimes up to a day. This sort of spa for logs has a purely practical purpose. The hot water softens the wood, making it more plastic and pliable. Without this, further processing would be impossible, as cold wood would simply crumble and break. After their bath, the logs are fed to a line where their bark is stripped off. Special machines quickly and efficiently clean the trunk, 
leaving a smooth, light surface. Then the logs are sewn into standard lengths, ready for the main stage of transformation. The heart of the entire plywood production process is the peeling lathe. This is where something incredible happens, something that contradicts our usual understanding of wood processing. The prepared log, clamped at both ends, begins to rotate at a huge speed around its axis. A long, razor-sharp knife, installed parallel to the axis of rotation, is slowly brought towards it. As it cuts into the wood, it begins to peel off not shavings, but a continuous, seamless ribbon just one or two millimeters thick. It's like unrolling a giant roll of paper towels. The machine literally unrolls the trunk, like a scroll of ancient papyrus, turning a three-dimensional cylinder into a flat, long ribbon. This ribbon is called veneer. The long sheet of veneer moves further down the conveyor where giant clippers chop it into sheets of standard size. All that's left of the log is a thin central cylinder, the so-called pencil, which is then used for other purposes. Freshly made veneer contains a lot of moisture, which is an enemy of the strength and stability of the future plywood. Therefore, the next mandatory stage is drying. The veneer sheets are fed into long, multi-tiered drying chambers. Inside them, as if on the shelves of a giant cabinet, the sheets slowly move on a conveyor, while hot air intensely blows on them from all sides. The temperature and speed of the air are strictly controlled to dry the veneer evenly and avoid cracking or warping. In a few minutes, the damp and flexible sheets turn into light, slightly brittle, and perfectly dry blanks, ready for gluing. At this stage, the dried veneer sheets are sorted by quality. Then they pass through a glue spreading machine. Special rollers, dipped in a bath of synthetic glue, usually based on phenol formaldehyde or urea resins, apply a uniform, sticky film to one side of every other sheet. Next begins the process of forming the layup. A dry sheet of veneer is placed on a table. On top of it, a sheet coated with glue is placed. And here lies the main secret. Each subsequent sheet of veneer is laid so that the direction of its grain is perpendicular to the previous one. If the first sheet's grain runs lengthwise, then the second's runs crosswise, the third's lengthwise again, and so on. This cross-grain structure is the key to plywood strength. It paralyzes the wood's natural tendency to split along the grain and evenly distributes the load over the entire area of the sheet. That's why plywood is equally strong in all directions. The number of layers in the layup is always odd, so that the structure is symmetrical, and the outer layers have the same grain direction. The formed layups of veneer are fed to the most powerful section of production, the hot press. This is a giant multi-level structure, between whose plates several dozen future plywood sheets are loaded simultaneously. When the press is loaded, the plates begin to close, with an enormous force, reaching tens of kilograms per square centimeter, the plates compress the veneer layups, turning them into dense, thin blocks. At the same time, the plates are heated to a temperature of 302 degrees Fahrenheit. Under the influence of high pressure and temperature, the glue polymerizes, penetrating into the pores of the wood and permanently bonding the layers into a single, incredibly strong monolith. The pressing process lasts for several minutes, after which a finished plywood board is born. Hot sheets of plywood come out from under the press and are stacked for gradual cooling. This is important to avoid internal stresses in the material. After cooling, the sheets undergo final processing. Powerful circular saws trim the edges, giving the sheets precise geometric dimensions. Then comes sanding. The sheets pass through sanding machines with endless abrasive belts, which make their surface perfectly smooth and even. After this, each sheet undergoes strict quality control. Inspectors check it for defects, delaminations, knots, cracks, glue spots, 
Depending on the surface quality, the plywood is assigned a certain grade and a corresponding marking is applied to it. The finished, sorted and packaged stacks of plywood are sent to the warehouse to later become part of furniture, houses, ships and countless other structures, demonstrating to the whole world how human intellect can improve upon nature itself. The global scale of production is also impressive. Annually, over 150 million cubic meters of plywood are produced worldwide. If you were to load all of this quantity into railway cars, the resulting train would circle our planet at the equator several times. The pencil that remains after peeling the veneer is a vivid example of how modern production strives for maximum waste-free efficiency. It is not waste, but a valuable raw material for which there are several clearly defined paths. Its future fate depends on the thickness and quality of the wood. If the cylinder is massive enough, it is sent to a sawing line, where it gets a second life in the form of lumber. Small boards and bars are cut from it, which are ideal for creating the invisible but strong frames for sofas and armchairs, legs for chairs, elements of children's beds, or wooden pallets.